Thank you, Nessie, for leading us in prayer this morning. Just a few announcements for your diary just now. Um, this, morning, this, this week our program consists of drop-in. Because of Christmas, things are starting to wrap up. Tomorrow night is intercessory prayer, 8 o'clock here. And this will be led, the worship will be led by Sylvia Gorley, and the prayer time will be led by Andrew Hull. Before you, you can see the sheep um, sat on the table with their bags. They're ready and they are waiting to go. And I know you've done it already, but pass on our thanks to the knitters because they're amazing. And like Nessie said this morning, they may have all had the same pattern, but there's a variety of sheep there and not one of them looks the same. I'm pretty sure there's a sermon in that somewhere. Um, but that will be starting on Friday, so the shops will be getting them tomorrow. There's ten leaflets there. If you know any children and you want to take the leaflets away today, then they're ready and waiting. We designed our own leaflets this year because um, the organisation we were going to get them from, we couldn't change the way it was laid out. So we've had a go at making our own this year. Sunday the 6th of December, next Sunday, our meeting will be led by, by Major Imogen Stewart. And this will also include the gift service. So if you have the bags of toiletries and things for Glen Alva, um, please bring them next week. There are some gift bags at the back of the hall, if you do have them. There it's uh, the left-hand side of the hall, because the right-hand side, that's the bags for the sheep. Please do not get them mixed up. <laughs> So the 9th of December, Wednesday the 9th of December, core council followed at 10, followed by the pastoral care council. If you have any ideas, um, one idea was mentioned this morning to me, if you have any ideas for the core council, um, fundraising, something spiritual, anything that you think as a core we should enter into, please, please let us know. Sunday the 20th of December, um, in our planning for Christmas, Philip and I were, thought, were thinking about having a songs of praise. And so we're asking for your help. We're asking for you to come with either a carol or a poem or a prayer. And so everyone's going to get these at the end of the meeting along with something else. I think that's all the announcements. Tuesday night. Oh, sorry, yes. Now, let me get this right. Tully Garley. Tully Garley. We're at the, um, we're at Tully Garley with the, for the switching of the lights, and then we're in the church in the marketplace for singing. And as we are responsible for the singing, please, as many of us, come along. <laughs> Drafting extras, um, you're going to need that to drown out us too. Um, but we'll have, we'll have CDs, but yeah. It's 7 o'clock at the tree. At the tree. Thank you, Nessie. Okay, and next year, um, as part of our celebrations, celebrating 129 years of the core, we're thinking about an away day still, and um, we still need numbers. Um, so if you're interested, um, forget about cost for the now. We just need to know how many people would be interested. Um, the money may come somewhere else. We're looking into getting it financed so that it doesn't cost us. I think that's the end, yeah. Okay. Now, it may not be orthodox, but just now, may we wait upon you for your offering, please. Thank you. Can you take it?
A lot of the father we take for granted at times. But father, we just thank you for everything. And father, as we would give to you our monetary giving this one, father, we ask that you accept it and bless it. And father, let us use it for your work in this part of your vineyard. And your precious name we are. We know that this Sunday is the first Sunday in, of Advent, and as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ, our theme over the next few weeks, our overarching theme, will be unwrapping Christmas. We'll be thinking about the gifts that were presented to Jesus, the gift of gold, the gift of frankincense, and the gift of myrrh. And so this morning we're going to be thinking around the theme of gift of gold. Gold, the gift of royalty. One Christmas, this is what a little boy said. Thanks for the electric guitar you gave me for Christmas, little Chris Cody said to his uncle. The first time he saw him after the holidays, it's the best present I ever got. That's great, said his uncle. Do you know how to play it? Oh, I don't play it, the little fella said. My mum gives me a dollar a day not to play it during the day, and my dad gives me five dollars a week not to play it at night. The gift that just keeps on giving. I, have, I, I think I have said to my sister that we're thinking about getting our niece one of those little microphones, electric microphones. It didn't go down very well, um, but we'll see. But we'll carry on in worship and we'll sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. And Richard will light the candle. Sorry? Richard will light the candle um, during this song. And there is three verses recorded. So I think we'll sing the first three and we'll... We'll read the last one. We'll, when the music stops, we'll sing. We'll read. We'll get there. If you'd like to stand. <coughs> Thank you. 
Amen. If you'd like to take your seats. Thank you to Richard for also um, decorating the hall this morning and for the, the inventive use of our Advent candles this morning. We can guarantee that no one has an Advent wreath like this. It's nice that we have candles for those who are online listening that are changing colour as we speak. It's, it's quite beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> now, a few weeks ago, um, the men went to their Christian Vision for Men, and we heard from Robert and Richard last week about um, how God had inspired them that day. And so this morning, I'm just asking Philip um, to come and share. I think um, from what's been said already in relation to this, you would have heard that it, it was a very good day. And, um, but one of the sort of themes that was coming out of, of the teaching that was given is men in church are a minority. And some of the statistics that they shared that day, and we have available in their leaflet, which was given by some research that they had been doing, 50% of men feel comfortable in a lady's underwear shop. 33% of men feel comfortable in church. It really makes you think, doesn't it? And by the current rate of loss, by 2028, men will have disappeared from church in the UK completely. It, it is sad and it's, it's very worrying, isn't it? 64% of the UK population, men and women, can think of no reason why they would go to church. And when you hear things like that, or like this where it says men think church is irrelevant, it, it makes you think, why, what's their experience of church? Why do they think that? What impression, perhaps, are they getting of church? to make them think that. And it makes our mission and our ministry even harder, doesn't it, when, um, when we have communities around the country that aren't encouraged to come to church or don't see the need to come to church. And yet we are created to be worshippers of the one who created us and the one who died for us. So the day itself was really challenging in that respect because it kind of set the tone really for what the church is about not just ministering to men but also to women and we shouldn't um, we shouldn't forget that but I think perhaps there are things that can be done here locally and around the around the wider world to be reaching out to men in our communities and I'm sure over the next couple of weeks and days we can have those discussions and some conversations have already happened about how we can perhaps reach out to men and women in our community. So I'll leave this available. You can have a look at it um, if you want to sort of have a look at some of the other things that they've put on here. The organisation themselves, Christian Vision for Men, they, they do various things throughout the year um, for men's ministries. And one of the things they hold, or they're holding next year in replace of the conference that we went to, is a, an event called The Gathering, which I think is over the course of a weekend. Um, you stay in tents and you involve yourself with various sports games, um, Bible teachings and worship activities and various other events. Um, so it's sad to think that the event we went to won't happen again, not in that way anyway, it's only led by CVM. Um, but we can continue to pray that something will be provided and maybe that's, as Robert says, something that we could look at doing locally here as well. So yes, it was a challenge to go, it was good to go um, and I think like anything like this it really opens our eyes to the reality of what we're facing as a church nowadays. So thank you. That's what we exist for, don't we? The salvation of men, women and children. And perhaps Christmas is one of the easiest times to evangelise because the gift 
of Jesus Christ at Christmas. There's just something very special about it. So I pray that everything that we do, the family appeal, the messy sheep, just our daily being around town, wherever we find ourselves this Christmas time, maybe, may we be a light to someone else. May we lead someone to salvation. A man, woman, child, it doesn't matter. And reminded from the words, they shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, and sit down in the kingdom of God. Both the rich and the poor, the despised and the distressed, they'll sit down in the kingdom of God. Perhaps nothing more speaks of this than the Christmas story. The shepherds, the wise men, Mary and Joseph and Jesus were all in the same place at the same time. And so just now I invite you to sing those words with me. And this will lead us into a time of prayer. And as we pray, we'll be using a reflection called Pin in Our Hopes on Jesus. But let's sing just now, they shall come from the east. We bless you, our God, mighty sovereign power. 
gentle, caring mother, you do not forget your children. You, we bless you, our, our God, for your great gifts to us. Creation, fragile and fascinating. Scripture, revealing your truth. And you bless us with your forgiving love, with the vision of your kingdom, shedding light in our darkness. Bless us and disturb us, God, with the vision of your kingdom. And as we voice our hopes to you now, may they strengthen us, reassure us, and move us. We pray for those caught up in wars around the world, soldiers, refugees, and those who hold fast to the reasons for their fighting. We pray for those who are homeless, excluded from what the rest of us are doing, cold, struggling to keep a hold of who they are. We pray for those who are ill, coping with pain, fear and the worst. And for those who work in the health service, who worry for the future. We pray for those struggling relationships, especially at this family time, when the cracks are kept just below the surface. And for the deepest hopes of our hearts, we pray now. Into the mess of this world, a fragile child will come, yelling in the night for his mother, needing milk and clean linen. We pin our hopes on you, little baby, our God, pushed out into the world through pain and into poverty. Our God is with us and our hope is reborn. Amen. And as we think about the gift of gold this morning, pinning our hopes on Jesus as we prepare in this time of Advent, also at the end of the meeting, there will be giving you one of these, a gold present with a little message wrapped on it. But I wonder if it finds a place in your home after today. Maybe on the tree. Maybe just by the door as you come in or go out. But wherever you choose to take this and choose to put this, we just pray that it will remind you that when we unwrap Christmas, we know what we're getting. We know about the gift of Christ. And may this Christmas we share this with one another. We're going to sing again the first Noel. The angel did say to the shepherds the message was given first. I invite you to stand if you, if you would like or if you want to prefer to be seated. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a break in the middle because of the music.
short introduction as the music restarts. if it's clear to you, the um, picture that's on the screen just now. The heading says king size bed and underneath is the manger. There's some pictures that say that this was the first king size bed. Some thoughts to ponder. Our reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 1 to 17. And as you know from this passage, this passage is the genealogy of Jesus. And this morning, um, Philip has decided that he'd like this to be done by video, rather than to be read. <laughs> I think that's a way of getting out of all the complicated names. But if you do want to follow, it's, we are taking the reading from Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 1 to 17. Jacob, Jacob, he had Judah in his kin. Well, then Perez and Zerah came from Judah's woman Tamar. Perez, he brought Hezron up and then came Aram, then Amenadab, then Nashan, who was then the dad of Salmon, who with Rahab fathered Boaz. Ruth, she married Boaz, who had Obed, who had Jesse. Jesse, he had David, who we know as king. David, he had Solomon by dead Uriah's wife. Solomon, well, you all know him. He had good old Rehoboam, followed by Abijah, who had Asa. Asa had Jehoshaphat, had Joram, had Isaiah, who had Jotham, then Ahaz, then Hezekiah. Followed by 
by Manasseh who had Amon who was a man who was father of a good boy named Josiah who grandfather Jehoiakim who caused the Babylonian captivity because he was a liar and then he had Shealtiel who begat Zerubbabel who had Abiud, who had Eliakim Eliakim had Azer, who had Zadok, who had Achim Achim was the father of Eliab then He had Eliezer, who had Nathan, who had Jacob now Listen very closely, I don't want to sing this twice Jacob was the father of Joseph, husband of Mary Mother of Christ You can see why it was easier to have it sung to us than <laughs> we had somebody read them out in college. Um, he got to the end, but <laughs> it was a bit of a challenge for him to, to read them all out. Have you ever tried doing a family tree? Yes, a couple of you know. This is a picture coming up of the royal family tree. Now, you probably can't see that very well. Um, it's a bit small, isn't it? But that's, that's basically the royal family tree. We have right at the top, we have, I think it's even off of the, the screen, uh, King Alfred the Great, and all the way down through the Wessex family, the Norman family, uh, right down through the 1300s and the 1400s to the Tudor family, 1700s, 1800s to the Windsor family, which is here, um, down to 1926 when Queen Elizabeth II was born. And then, of course, it carries on, I think even off, even off of the, the page there, to the birth of Prince George in 2013 and Princess Charlotte, who was born in May this year. So quite a complicated family tree. I'm not even going to attempt to, uh, to try and explain it. I'm just grateful for people, um, historians, and, and uh, people who uh, take the time to put these things together for us to, to read and look at. I'm assuming uh, by now that most of us have uh, our plans in place for Christmas. And we have some understanding as how we expect Christmas to look this year. But we've had uh, conversations with family and friends about what to do for Christmas Day, uh, for, for exchanging of gifts and meals and, and all those sorts of details. But as we count down the next few weeks to Christmas, as we've, as we've said about and as we've prayed about, it's very easy to be distracted into all of the busyness of Christmas. Um, and I just encourage us all, myself included, to take, to take some time to remember Jesus Christ coming to earth. It's his birthday we are celebrating. I really think prayed that earlier. You know, we are celebrating. It's a birthday. You know, let's, let's, in the words of the TC, let's party <laughs> about that. Because it is something worth celebrating, absolutely. And it's so easy, as I said, to be distracted from that. The birth of Jesus attracted attention. And uh, like anyone does when a baby is born, gifts were brought as a way of celebrating and welcoming a new life into the world. But there is a difference in the type of gifts brought 2,000 years ago to Jesus to what you or I would give to a newborn baby today. And one of the gifts that was brought was gold. And it is gold which is described as the gift of royalty. Jesus' family tree portrays his human nature. He is part of a family born here on earth. But the nature of events around the Christmas time speak of his divine nature. Jesus' position within the world placed him as divine, coming from heaven, God's only son. The way in which people responded to his coming speaks of his royal position. The bringing of gold was, and still is, very much the gift given to a king. The wise men knew that Jesus was not going to be known as baby Jesus or will be known as the baby, but that he was King Jesus. And their offering of gold was in fact their, part of their offering of worship. 
the giving of something which was hard to come by, difficult to dig up from the ground, but was endurable and could withstand almost anything. Gold had, gold had meaning. The giving of gold had meaning. And whereas today the gifts to newborn babies usually involve something soft and cuddly, I believe we can all follow the example of giving to Jesus, which is to us the gift of the highest value. In other words, giving of our lives to him. So gold is physically strong, it has value, it has meaning, it symbolizes royalty, but despite what we may think, we'll one day perish. The Apostle Peter writes that our faith is more valuable than gold. Gold is tested, as is our faith, but our faith will grow and strengthen through the trials and hardships we face. Our faith can bear fruit, fruit that will last, and it is because of Christ that we have faith, and it is in Christ where our faith is placed. So gold is the gift of royalty and by bringing it to the newborn king we present a symbol of bringing worth and worship to him and as we bring ourselves as an act of worship to him we represent what was done almost 2,000 years ago can I just share this story with you just now please the story is told of an African chief who lived in a simple grass hut and sat on an elegant, hand-carved wood, wooden throne. After ruling for a few years, he became a bit haughty and decided that wood wasn't good enough for him. He wanted a gold throne. So he commissioned his craftsmen to create a beautiful gold throne, and he took the wood one and stored it in the small attic of his hut. A few months later, the sounds of warring natives from another tribe were heading approaching the village and the African chief quickly assumed that they would probably be coming to steal his gold throne. So he exchanged the thrones, bringing the wooden one back down and hiding the, the gold one in the attic. While he sat there anticipating the arrival of the enemy tribal warriors, suddenly the gold throne upstairs broke through the ceiling and came crashing down on the chief's head and killed him. I don't know how true that story is or if there's any reference to uh, a real life situation. It's got here the moral of the story, people in grass houses shouldn't stow throats. <laughs> but it shows that gold has weight, so it's valuable, it's expensive. So what the, the wise men brought in terms of gold wasn't cheap stuff, it, it had meaning. It was important, it was significant. But they knew Jesus deserved only the best because he is here for us. Matthew writes the genealogy of Christ in the opening verse of his, uh, of his book, of his gospel, because it was important to first century Jews. Anyone who starts reading the Bible from the New Testament will be put in, picture, will be put in the picture by reading the names of many generations. Matthew is saying to his readers that the birth of Christ is something that Israel has been waiting for. There are also stories to share along the way since creation. Each name is listed, played a part in God's plan for the world. Matthew is highlighting the fulfillment of God's plan. He is bridging readers from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And in doing so highlights the significant position of Christ in the history of the world. Roman Wearsby describes the Old Testament as a book of promise and the New Testament as a book of fulfillment. And as we continue to read through the story of Christmas, we will begin to see the fulfilled Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. So, Jesus was born a king and therefore received the gift worthy of, royal, of a royal person. The gift of gold symbolizes worship and worth. 
His position within the line of succession tells us that this, that this is something God had planned and something the Old Testament prophets told us was going to happen. And finally, Matthew's point was for his Jewish readers to know Christ was the promised Messiah and his coming to earth had more significant meaning than any other child. Jesus came as a baby, born a king, lived as a teacher, died as a saviour, rose as a redeemer, and ascended as ruler. But to us today, we can bring our valuable gifts and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the King of glory. We can bring the gifts that he has given us back to Jesus and say, this is for you. We bring our lives and we say, take my life and let it be. And we're just going to sing through, please, a little song, which takes, takes, takes us through, really, the life of, of Jesus. Who is he in yonder store, at whose feet the shepherds fall? Tis the Lord, O wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall, crown him, crown him Lord of all. And as I say, this song, the song takes us through the life of Christ, but with that continuing reminder that he is the King of glory, at whose feet we come and offer our gifts. And maybe that's something you're challenged to do this morning, you feel prompted to do, is to come and offer yourselves once again to him at his feet this morning. And if that's something that the Lord is calling you to do so, then I invite you to respond to that call, perhaps here at our place of prayer, or where you're seated this morning, to offer yourselves to the King of glory. But we'll sing this song through together now, as the opportunity is given.
And I pray that this Christmas we will be those that come and humbly fall at his feet. For he is the King of glory. His is a wonderful story. The story of what he does in our own lives, the story of what he, we can read about in the Gospel. Who is he, the King of glory? Let's pray together. Loving Lord Jesus, we, we come before you this morning, we recognise your kingship. We come, Lord, and we humbly fall and bow our knee at your throne. Lord, thank you for coming to be amongst us. Thank you for knowing what it's like. Thank you for experiencing the things you did, Lord, and so you know what we go through each day. But we pray just now that this Christmas time will be a time when we continue to fall at your throne. That you will once again come make yourself known and real to us this time of year, Lord. That through all the busyness we will focus on you. Lord, we pray for our friends and family, perhaps people in our lives that don't know you. They don't know the reason behind Christmas. We pray, Lord, that something we say or do, perhaps in the Christmas card we give them, the conversations we have, Lord, may they see that it is because of you that we celebrate Christmas. And it's because of you that we choose to live our lives the way we do, Lord, because you've called us to do so. So, Lord, help us to give all of what we are to you. We don't always find it easy to give things up, Lord, but we know that you deserve every part of our lives, Lord. So, Lord, just as the wise men brought gold, the gift of royalty and the gift of high value and high meaning, so we give to you ourselves. Take our lives, Lord, and may they be used for your glory and your kingdom's work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know how many Christmas carols you've sung already this year. Perhaps this morning has been the first couple of carols that you've sung this year, but we're going to conclude in singing one more. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful, all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Isn't that a great message to proclaim this Christmas time? Not just at Christmas, but all the year, all the year through, we proclaim that Christ is born in Bethlehem. Please stand if you're able. There are three verses. We'll sing them through together. Thank you.
the benediction together from 2 Corinthians. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, may you be with us this week as we go out to proclaim that Christ is born in Bethlehem. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.